I bid you welcome. I welcome you to my house. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my home. Hello Horror Hounds, welcome to my horror house. Throughout the year, I'm gonna be looking at the works of James Herbert. I've decided to call 2022 the year of James Herbert. And we start at the very beginning, the, the bombshell novel that was The Rats, the one that started it all, the one that really cemented, if not started, a whole new wave of horror, especially in the UK. It was published in 1974, so around about the same time Carrie was being published and Jaws was being published over in the United States of America. James Herbert is a very different kind of beast. I would suggest that he's one of, if not the godfather of the splatterpunk movement that would come later in the 80s. What he very much wanted to do with this book was a short, sharp kick to the bollocks, really. He, he wasn't at all interested in, in shying away from the reality of the horrors that he was presenting. He wanted a very visceral, a very descriptive uh, kind of horror story. The Rats, as you might expect, is a story about killer rats, giant mutant killer rats. Uh, and uh, you could just leave it there, really, if you wanted. There was a little more going on under the, the bonnet than just that. But for his purposes, that kind of was enough. He wanted to show what it would really feel like to be eaten alive by rats and <laughs> by Jingo does he? The rats would have been plugging into an eco horror wave that was building in the in the mid seventies. Uh, lots of uh, nature attacks books and films around about this time. An awful lot of um, killer themed creature stuff uh, and uh, careers coming in the wake of James Herbert's The Rats. I think mean, Guy N. Smith with his crabs novels, Sean Hudson and, and The Slugs is a clear example of a couple of uh, uh, writers absolutely writing James Herbert's slipstream. What we'll find in, in videos to come is that Herbert's not content to sit on his laurels and will stretch and develop himself as a writer. Uh, but this is a pretty punky start. It, it really does go for the throat. It's, it's pretty rough around the edges, as you might expect for a first novel. But my God, it, it motors along. It's, it's not particularly long, but it, it hit a nerve with the British public. I think the first print run of 100,000 copies sold out in three days. I was, just, I was just looking at the print information in this version of my book, which says, uh, I mean, goodness me, listen to this. Um, paperback edition November 1974, new edition July 76, reprinted September 76, reprinted January 77, reissued in a new edition April 77, reprinted September 77, reprinted November 77, reprinted June 78, reprinted May 79. I mean, it goes on and on and on, reprinted December 1985. It just, it just never ends. I don't know if it's out of print now, but I think um, certainly The Rats in his second book, The Fog, just, just stayed in print. For, for decades. The long and the short of it is that the book concerns a new strain of giant killer rats that infests the East End of London. And then as rats are wont to, they spread and, and, and breed and become a plague that threatens to overrun the entirety of London. We follow our hero Harris, who is an art teacher in the East End of London in a more impoverished area of the city. He grew up there, this was his old stomping ground, and he feels a certain uneasy kind of alliance towards that area, which is why he's returned to teach there rather than uh, go uh, anywhere up and down the country that's, that, that's more fancy, that's, that's posher, that's classier, basically. And this is where some of the subtext comes in. It, it seems strange to talk about subtext in a book that is about giant mutant rats eating people, but there is some, and I think this is one of the things that sets Herbert apart from his imitators. Uh, right from the start, um, sections of the rats are set in the areas of London where he grew up as a kid. Um, Harris's chip on his shoulder about uh, the government 
not really paying attention to the poorer areas of the city, this sort of inequality and inherently unfair class system that we have in the UK is a sort of seething anger that runs all the way through uh, the book. Naturally, the rats breed and spread at first in the poor areas and start eating the poor people. And it's really, it's really only a massive problem <laughs> when, when they, they spread and you know start moving towards some of the more affluent areas of the city. He has a character in this, uh, an establishment man, a civil servant man called Foskins. And the real hypocrisy of the ruling classes is, is, is sort of laid bare where um, the government's first approach to dealing with it, uh, the rat problem, fails and then publicly Foskins falls on his sword and loses his, his position. But Harris learns uh, behind the scenes uh, that pretty much nothing has changed. Or, all of, the, all of the, the, the changes made are for the headlines and for the show and for, for, the, for the public and behind the scenes, everyone keeps their old jobs and everything keeps ticking on as it normally does. One of the things that slightly stretches credulity here is um, how Herbert keeps his central hero, Harris, in the mix, really wants the government take over and there's forces mobilized to, uh, and, and a sort of, uh, machinery put in place to try and deal with the huge problem of the rats. Um, it stretches credulity that Harris would still be involved. And there's a couple of planking, creaking sort of plot devices that he uses to keep his hero front and centre that um, I think he identifies and we'll see how he has enormously improved upon that, even by his second book, The Fog. If I had to level another criticism at the rats, it's that his hero Harris is is kind of a blank slate. This is something that uh, I think we'll see time and time again with Herbert. I think he does it on purpose. I'm sure I read an interview with him many, many years ago where he says he likes, he doesn't like to really describe his hero or give too much information about his hero because he likes his readers to be able to put themselves in the place of the protagonist as much as possible and doesn't want to exclude too many people. And I think there's, there's, there's maybe a, a certain logic to that and I can get where he's coming from, but, but some sort of characterization, some, some thing that we can, we can hook onto and start rooting for the guy. He gets much, much better at this. But I will say that for his, um, for his entire output, I think he's probably only created two, maybe three really memorable individual hero characters. Uh, an awful lot of his protagonists come straight from uh, the Harris mold, straight from his first novel. They're sort of bluff, gruff, slightly cynical, slightly grizzled older men uh, who get a younger love interest and, and, and then get involved in, 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 in escalating madness that, uh, that they have to try and uh, stop and uh, at the same time survive. Another device he employs straight out of the gate from his first book, which he will come to refine and will become a real mark of his writing, are his um, sort of vignette chapters, his thumbnail character uh, chapters. For all that uh, his protagonist, Harris, is a blank slate, he, he populates the rest of, uh, of the novel with lots of very uh, richly detailed characters who we get to know within the space of a chapter. We learn an awful lot about their lives and then we watch them die horrifically. Herbert will uh, really refine this, these sort of vignette chapters, which do help flash out a world and help flash out um, epic scenarios, especially when he's going for um, sort of a global or large scale epic, sort of a disaster feels. It's probably, you'll probably, when you read it, you, you, you can see that this is a guy still working out what his strengths and weaknesses are because for for such a for such a slim volume we possibly spend half that time with with our hero harris and the other half with the people of london most of which it has to be said are sort of the working classes or the homeless and the, the down and outs the the real the working joes you and me the people um at the heel end of, of the boot shall we say which really does sort of hammer home sort of the, the class subtext to this, uh, which is sort of upended at the end of the book when we find out that the rats themselves have a hierarchy which is not 
at all dissimilar to, to our idea of sort of uh, top-down rules, a sort of um, monarchy type scenario the rats themselves have got going on is, um, is absolutely intentional. Yes, it's, it's a slim book and it has absolutely no fat on it. it. It rattles along and escalates and escalates. One of the other things that uh, Herbert does brilliantly well is, is the set piece and he's going to become better and better and better at that. But he, even here, um, he starts with a, a real statement of intent. We see a homeless man getting eaten alive and then almost immediately afterwards, um, a small baby and a dog are killed. So he, he lays out his stall and lets you know that he, he's not going to hold back with anything and, and neither does he. Yeah, it was published in 1974. Some of the attitudes of, uh, are dated. Um, they're, they're not horrific. They're just, um, they're just of their time. And if, if you don't sort of anticipate that reading a book that's now almost 50 years old, um, just a little bit of context is is all you need. So an, an absolute powerhouse of of a start of a career. His, his first novel, instant bestseller, doesn't go out of print. Kickstarts not just his career, but the career of many other imitators after him. And um, after the rats, he gives us uh, a, a book that is, is still one of his fan favourites and one that I'll be talking uh, about. Uh, uh, next time, The Fog. It was a short, sharp kick to the bollocks. <laughs>